Mo Mortazavi, I'm medical director over at Spark Sports Medicine Concussion Center. Uh, I'm one of the physicians here that um, sees patients and helps with the academics and research uh, in our center here. Um, my main role is uh, really overseeing the concussion program that we have here, which is a comprehensive concussion program, um, and uh, uh, really um, uh, ultimately providing the best care, best, best standard of care, best practices, not only for concussion, but also for all of our sports injuries that we have here. And I had a chance to meet Dave Oakley and, and, and the Wavi team, who had put together a pretty amazing tool um, with, with the Wavi device. Uh, that uh, was FDA approved and, and over a five, seven minute span could give us some of the key pieces of information that we used to spend hours trying to obtain doing a QEG. So um, all of a sudden, you know, I think that really just the practicality of it in, in a clinical setting where, you know, we see a lot of patients uh, in, in, in our clinic. We you know, we, we can be seeing close to 100 concussion visits a week sometimes during the busy season. So we don't have a ton of time to spend hours and hours doing one test. So the ability to uh, have a test that uh, relatively quickly can give us a lot of robust information um, about and right to the primary source of the brain. So what the voltages look like, what the P300 looks like, and then a number of other markers that are important for us as well, such as reaction time, cognitive visual, mood markers, so on and so forth. Uh, being able to talk to him and talk through some of the cases that we've run here now using Wavi has been fantastic and um, without a doubt it's been a, a very useful clinical tool with strong clinical utility in, in a number of our cases, particularly our complex cases that are that are struggling more. Important. I think the most important thing for us was it was based off of established research and data on, on EEG for many years. And that's that was the key. It wasn't some new tool looking at some new thing that hadn't been tested before, or really uh, well investigated or proven. But we also have a ton of more complex patients here who have had symptoms for more than four weeks, prolonged symptoms. And uh, the, the nature of our clinic is a lot of the, the more complex cases get referred to us. So we have a lot of those. And I, I knew, I had a pretty good feeling that this this tool, after having practiced it a few times uh, on myself, on our staff, that it would have good utility in that case. And of course, once we started to run it um, and review it with patients and get the information that we got and, and have it uh, direct management in the ways it did, uh, we, we knew it was a very useful tool. And that's where, you know, I think Wavi's really exciting because it allows, it gives us a much more practical, quicker way to be able to do this during the visit in the clinic if we feel like we need to. Um, it's a cloud-based system, uh, like a lot of the cognitive tests, so we can easily share uh, uh, the reports with, with other experts that need to look at it. You know, I'm often doing that with Dave Oakley, for example, um, and uh, going through uh, reports of patients and looking at the data. and. So that's easily done because they have this cloud database where, where, where the reports are. And uh, at the end of the day, able to give the patient um, feedback through our uh, clinical portal within 24 to 48 hours, writing them a letter of what the consensus of their study looks like and as a result, what are our recommendations um, with respect to return to work, return to learn, um, with respect to other referrals that they might need. Clinically, anecdotally, we're seeing that the P300s seem to really follow uh, clinical recovery trajectories very closely, and they seem to bring something else to the table, which is extra sensitivity. What we're seeing is when everything else starts to normalize, including some of the other tests, cognitive testing is even looking, you know, certainly the history and exam is normal, but the cognitive testing is starting to look normal, the exertional testing is starting to look normal. There tends to be two things that, that, that are still off in some of these folks that aren't ready. P300 is one of them, of the studies we do, and the other one tends to be the oculomotor testing. So those are really showing themselves to be two of the more sensitive things that get that normalize later and later. But uh, from our perspective, particularly because we do have 
a lot of complex cases and a lot of high-risk situations where folks have had a number of previous head injuries and they're going back to potentially high-risk sport like football. We want to have sensitive tools that if we're seeing that some things appear to still be off, we can give them some extra time to fully recover. And in those cases, again, anecdotally in some of our early clinical research that we're doing here, we're seeing that these things are normalizing. It's just taking a little bit longer. Um, and we know that the proximity factor is a big deal in head injuries and long-term issues. So if folks have head injuries with low proximity, back-to-back, -back, so to speak, then they're going to have more problems down the road. So it makes a lot of sense to utilize tools, particularly in high-risk athletes, to, to, to really try to space out uh, the, the, the sort of the, the proximity factor or the, the risk factor that they have if they're not fully recovered. Uh, those head injuries that tend to be closer in proximity can result in uh, more long-term issues. So if we have some tools that can help reduce the risk of that, help us really figure out are they really truly fully recovered or are they still maybe in the healing window, even if it's 95%, even if they feel good, the brain hasn't really gotten back to that equilibrium yet, and space it out a little bit further so if there is another head injury coming down the road, at least the proximity isn't so close because the closer the proximity of head injuries, the, the more the more problems that folks are going to have down the road. Yeah, I mean, I think as a brain health tool, um, Wavi's fantastic because it's quick. It, you know, you're not going to go through you know, eight hours of neuropsych assessment um, and then have to do you know, a number of other things to get you know, the, the information that you can get with a relatively you know, quick run of the Wavi. Um, particularly my high-risk athletes, I would love to have baseline testing on them. So when they come in and I start to assess oculomotor dysfunction, I know what they look like before they were ever injured. When we start to assess cognitive testing, we know what it looked like. When we do QEG, we know what it, what it looked like, or, or, or Wavi, we know what it looked like before they were ever injured. Yeah, so the, the Wavi tool is nice because it gives us a number of different measurements or markers um, from reaction time to cognitive visual scores on the trail mapping. The P300s, of course, is the, really the meat of the study. Um, the F3, F4 marker, which is a mood anxiety marker, um, an impulsivity marker, which is the theta, beta, and then a couple of surface basically a couple of markers that act as surface EMG for what the muscle tensions look like in the occipital and the temporalis, and then the brain mapping. Um, so when we look through that, one of the big sort of uh, questions a lot of clinicians have to deal with when they have someone with prolonged symptoms is how much of what's going on is primary brain injury, organic brain injury, versus psychosocial stuff that are surrounding the injury because we know that particularly with prolonged symptoms after a concussion people can get depressed and people can have other issues that are happening so and to be able to tease those things out is very important one of the things we want to dive into is you know how much primary organic brain injury is there so if we're seeing uh, suppressed voltages and delayed p300 times that's suggestive of someone who's really struggling with a lot of primary brain injury and we're going to be much more likely to get them involved with a lot of the therapies that are, are out there that can help whether it's vestibular rehab sometimes even moving towards hyperbaric and some of those complex uh, uh, things a lot of times the cognitive behavioral therapy so on and so forth um, so those markers can guide us. Um, if the P300s look really good, it's also nice because it can be reassuring for us so we can go to the patient and tell them, listen, you know, your, your voltages look really good. We still have to address issues with your mood. We have to address issues with your sleep maybe. We have to address issues with neck tightness possibly. We have to address issues with your oculomotor dysfunction. You know, we still need to address these things, but at least we know that the, the, the voltages, the P300s look good. And that can be very reassuring and empowering for patients who may think they have permanent brain damage and so on and so forth. So that's, that's you know, one scenario. Another scenario, someone who is really struggling with a lot of primary brain dysfunction, it can be validating for them to see that a test that's looking at brain function is, is showing that, look, you're, you're, you do have significantly delayed P300s, your voltages are very suppressed, your brain map looks really abnormal, um, and 
it, it sort of helps guide them because a lot of the patients that have had prolonged symptoms are often being told it's in your head, you're, you know, you, why is this taking you so long to get better? And so, to, and of course, the, the classic neuroimaging, like a CT or an MRI, which is a structural or anatomic uh, test, is going to look normal in a lot of those cases. So really, you're dependent on functional tests, such as the QEG, the P300, the WAVI test, to, to really be able to tease out the primary brain injury that a lot of these folks have. It's one really robust tool that we have that can guide uh, us in those situations of trying to tease out I mean, to what degree do we have ongoing primary brain injury and uh, what directions do we need to go with the management. The other scenario where it can be a really useful tool with respect to decision making is a scenario where someone maybe has had prolonged symptoms or is, has a very complex concussion history. An athlete that's a high risk sport, let's say soccer, who's had four concussions in the past, he is, is here to see you with, with his fifth. Um, and. Uh, you know, maybe clinically is starting to look really good, normal exam, you know, normal cognitive testing, everything looks really good, max exertional testing without any problems. Uh, and that's a scenario where you can use the, the WAVI, the P300, as a very sensitive marker to really figure out do they still maybe have some residual issues. And if you see that the P300s are off, the brain map is off, other factors up, then you may, in that, that situation, talk to the patient and say, listen, you know, your testing is still not completely normal here, and we're going to give you another three months before we try to dive into this decision. And, you know, if the test continues to look abnormal, you may decide, ah, maybe we, we need to start to move towards low-risk sports. Whereas if it totally normalizes, it adds another layer of confidence in your decision-making for these complex return-to-play situations. Not that you need it in every return-to-play decision, but in some of the more complex ones, I think it's a very important tool. A number of patients who had their injuries two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, who are now coming to us saying, I just didn't realize there was anything to do about it. And for good reason, because things have evolved in the last five, ten years tremendously in terms of what we can do for mild traumatic brain injuries and residual issues that continue to go on. Um, so, you know, this, this tool in the sort of general world could be I could see its utility during physicals in, again, some of the more high risk uh, or, or unique subsets of the population that are likely to have had uh, brain injuries in their past or, or concussions. We started using the system because we felt it would have clinical utility. Of course, we need to prove that. Um, and uh, the first step was to anecdotally see that Yes, it was indeed a useful tool, and then, you know, after complying, uh, putting together a number of cases, you know, trying to put together some sort of data on, on its utility. Um, so, I mean, I think the reason why is we run a comprehensive concussion clinic here, and, and the whole idea of uh, having a comprehensive clinic is to be able to not leave any gaps. So, we want to be able to assess where people are at with primary brain function, with cognition, with visual, mood and psych, exertional tolerance, autonomic function. These are some of the big sort of profiles and, and, and domains in, in comprehensive concussion care. Um, we see a combination of musculoskeletal injuries here as well as a lot of concussions. Um, we see both simple and complex concussions here um, with prolonged recovery. Um, we are unique in that we have a pretty uh, um, high volume with all of our different providers. We see anywhere between 50 up to 100 concussions a week, depending on the, the busy season um, for that. And uh, um, really our goal here is to provide all the comprehensive services for concussions, um, including vestibular, oculomotor, vision, cognitive, um, uh, exertional, uh, being able to provide rehabilitative services here as well as uh, all the important testing that we need to do to figure out what people need in those different domains.